session, uh, the title is Data Curation, Archives and Libraries. It is moderated by Bente Megard and myself, and it comprises uh, seven papers which have been divided into two groups. Group one comprises papers on audio and audiovisual resources, while group two comprises papers on uh, written resources. The, um, the way we have uh, structured the, this session is as follows. I will be moderating the first group and Benta, then Benta will be the moderator for group two. And um, all authors of all groups, of both groups, have been asked to present their papers and at the same time answer the questions we have posed, we have addressed to them. And we have one different uh, question per group. And uh, so the authors will present their work and answer any, focusing on any of the sub questions we have uh, asked them. Uh, so we uh, do group one and then group two, and then we have some time uh, dedicated to discussion with the audience and more questions if there are, uh, if we have them. So uh, all authors uh, have three minutes to present their work and answer questions, and then they have more minutes to answer questions from the audience. So the first group with the audio audiovisual resources uh, are the following. The first one, Building a Home for Italian Audio Archives by Silvia Calamai, Nicolò Preto, Monica Monachini, Maria Francesca Stamuli, Silvia Bianchi and Pierangelo Bonazzoli. The second paper is Use Cases of the ISO Standard for Transcription of Spoken Language in the Project INL, INL by Anne Ferger and Daniel Getka. The third one, Evaluating uh, and assuring research data quality for audiovisual annotated language data by Timofey Arkangelsky, Hannah Hedeland, and Alexander Ryaposov. And the last one of group one is towards comprehensive definitions of data quality for audiovisual annotated language resource by Hannah Hedeland. So we first question uh, was uh, is the issue of quality. And this uh, issue was raised by all of the papers of this group. So this led us to pose the specific question, which is the following. One critical issue that emerges when creating resources, tools, or services is the issue of quality of data and metadata. The need for quality assurance is of great importance, both as regards creators of resources or tools services, and as regards archives, libraries, repositories, and infrastructures, hosting and distributing, sharing and distributing the resources. So what is the definition of quality for a resource or data or service? And the sub questions that we have asked the uh, authors to address are the following. Is quality related to the use and the reuse of a resource or a tool or a service and its uptake by the community? Is it an abstract concept or is it tightly related with the purpose of use of a resource? The second sub question, have you addressed the issue of quality of your resources, you yourself meaning as when creating the resources, data, tools, services, and their metadata, and how did you do that? And last question uh, on the part of the infrastructures, let's say, should archives or infrastructures measure the quality of the resources deposited at their repositories? And according to which criteria and which are the measurable dimensions? This is a whole bunch of questions and the authors were asked to choose to focus on any one of those when presenting their work. Let's move directly to the first paper of this group, which is Building a Home for Italian Audio Archives to be presented by Nicolo Preto. Okay, can you hear me? Perfectly. Perfect. Uh, hi to all. I'm Nicola Bretto and I'm here to present uh, this paper that presents uh, the Archivio Vivo project that uh, aims at design and develop an infrastructure under the uh, Clarinetti umbrella uh, for the preservation and the access of historical audio archives. 
the case study of the project uh, uh, is represented by the archive of Caterina Bueno. She is an Italian ethnomusicologist and uh, singer that collected hundreds of recordings concerning folk song, interview, concert, etc. And therefore, the collection is very heterogeneous and uh, can be reused uh, by users of different fields. And here come the first issue concerning the, the quality, different community uh, have their own uh, standard and criteria. And oral archives are at the crossroad of different fields uh, of knowledge, obviously, and we cannot consider all the standard. So this is the first issue. But uh, uh, let's say some work about the collection. It's composed by 476 uh, audio recordings uh, on open reel, open reel tapes uh, and audio cassettes. Probably most of you uh, used audio cassettes several years ago. And uh, can we say that uh, they have a good quality? Well, maybe not. Uh, but even if, if we use the best standard and the very best audio devices possible, uh, the audio quality could be very bad. Okay. And nevertheless, we can create a good quality a digital preservation copy and make them accessible uh, through documentary units. Okay. The latter is uh, an outcome of uh, a, a long, complex work okay, uh, of analysis and interpretation. And in case of error, uh, this process can create uh, fabrication of history. So uh, we need, uh, we can't accept this. Uh, we have to uh, assure the authenticity of the digitized data and to tackle this, this issue uh, is necessary a quality process, keeping track of each operation and give us, giving us the possibility to come back, to get back if uh, there, are, there are any error. And we, in Archivio Vivo, we designed a complete methodology for maintaining the history of the audio, of the recording from the creation of the preservation copy to the uh, audio document will be available to the users. And uh, here is very, this is a kind of quality pro process. The last aspect we have to take into account uh, about quality is the accessibility and uh, uh, the accessibility of the resource of what is. Okay, we must be able to access the audio document and all the related information. And uh, uh, there are two main aspects. The first is we have to be able to find it and then to listen it, okay? So uh, in conclusion, Archivio Vivo uh, proposes this methodology for preserving uh, the history of the, do and the document and dealing with three aspects related to quality. The first is audio preservation, the second is authenticity, and then accessibility. And uh, well, I finished the three minutes, so if you are interested to know more, uh, we can discuss on the paper session. So see you Thank later. You Thank much. you very much. Thank you very much, Nicolo, for uh, sticking to the three minutes slot. I know it's very short time and very tight schedule, but we will have time for discussion later on. The next presentation, which is use cases of the ISO standard for a transcription of spoken language in the project INEL. So by Anna Ferge and Daniel Yetka. Yeah, I will say something about this now, although okay. this is our uh, answer to the questions about data quality. Mm -hmm. this um, not, sorry? This is Would not the like presentation of our uh, contribution, but the answers for the data quality. Okay, you could just say one minute, about, uh, yeah, sure. do a short presentation of the paper and then answer the questions directly. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Uh, Anna, do you have the yeah. presentation? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, fine, yeah, thank great. you. Okay, um, so our paper was about um, how we use the ESO standard for transcription of spoken language in our project, like from the data perspective. And um, we're going to um, talk uh, about the um, more the quality aspect and how we get um, into the format. Um, but uh, in the paper, we more, um, we, um, talk more about which tools uh, we use um, to uh, actually um, use the standard. Um, the standard we're talking about is the ESO standard for transcription of spoken language of the TI format. 
and um, we use different tools to create uh, the data in our project. Um, the project in L is a language documentation project. Um, uh, um, it's about uh, languages spoken in uh, Northern Eurasia. And um, yes, <laughs> I think yeah, that was it. And now we can go into the quality part. Yes, thank you, Anna. So yes. Daniel, to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so concerning questions about qu data quality, we didn't really focus on one aspect because uh, we came up with a lot of ideas about this uh, right away. So we are very aware of data quality issues in our project. Um, we do continuous quality control during the creation of our language corpora. So we try to do all the quality assurance before actually publishing uh, our data. Mm, we use different curation tools for it. HCSK Corpus Service is a very central framework for us to use. Um, we actually do have a numerical measurements of the curation status of our corpora. Um, we can show some more figures and, and everything in breakout sessions later. So uh, anyone who's interested, please join us there. Um, so actually uh, in our project, the uh, quality of our data is already measured with numbers. Um, well, so the quality of the data during further processing is also very central. So we have search mechanisms which rely on uh, um, a specific degree of data quality to be reliable and reproducible. And um, some automated operations also work much better on higher quality data, obviously. And um, there was the uh, question about how to measure it. So I mentioned already, we do have numbers we have for the data quality. So count errors and uh, uh, similar stuff. Mm. We mainly do it with rule-based mechanisms, but uh, obviously it would be uh, also possible to use statistical methods, uh, find inconsistencies on the basis of patterns um, and go, go a little bit further this way. Okay, thank you very much, both of you, Daniel and Anne. We could move on to Timofey Arhangelsky, Hannah Hedelin, and Alexander Ryaposov evaluating and assuring research data quality for audiovisual annotated language data. So please. Well, I believe, uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Alexander, uh, yes. So should I start? Right. All right. So uh, I'm going to be talking about our paper, and a paper uh, talks. Uh, and presents the Quest project or quality established. And in short, the goal of the project is to develop uh, reliable quality standards and curation criteria for the materials that uh, are uh, sent later for archiving or other purposes. Uh, so we have uh, three tools and which we are currently developing. The first is uh, online questionnaire and or planning tool. It is based on Schmidt's questionnaire for depositors. And we have two possible scenarios for users to use this tool. First, uh, as a planning tool, when you are in a beginning stage of your project, you might uh, go through the questionnaire and see uh, which pitfalls might await you, what should you focus on, how should you better plan your work, etc. And uh, on the other hand, if you have uh, an already finished project or something that is uh, completing uh, its uh, final stage, uh, going through a questionnaire, we ask uh, the, the authors about data readability, data availability, legal aspects, and all these uh, uh, other things that are reliable to uh, quality of the project. So in the result, uh, after completing the questionnaire, you get a, a template, which you can see on the slide. Uh, and then the template is sent to the continuous automatic customized quality control tool. And also in the meantime, uh, the uh, resources are split into deposits, collections and corpora. But uh, I believe that Hannah will uh, talk about that uh, in a bit more detail in the next uh, presentation. So I won't uh, touch a lot on that. And uh, the automatic quality checker is based on the HZSK corporate services, which uh, Daniel mentioned in the previous presentation. Uh, but we tried to make it uh, available for use uh, for 
a wider auditory of linguists, that is the people who are maybe not really that uh, good with uh, like the technical background. So it just uh, works when you upload an archived file on the website and then you get the results of uh, your uh, quality check. So it currently supports the Xmeralda format uh, and uh, we also have uh, Elan and Folker support in the works. Uh, and based on the template that uh, uh, you send to it, uh, some certain checks are being turned on or off, uh, depending on what your data are. And it's not on the slide, but we also have a knowledge base, uh, which uh, contains explanations, uh, best practices advice, uh, and some other stuff for anybody who wants to deposit data, but maybe is not sure about uh, how to proceed with that. So to answer one of the questions, I think uh, quality data for us means that data is well described and it's consistent throughout uh, for both purposes of arch archiving and uh, reuse by future researchers or in non-research scenarios, as you can see on the slide. And also the data adheres to the standards of quality developed and shared by the uh, community. And that's why we have the community review uh, bubble <laughs> on our flow chart as well. Uh, so, well, I think that's it. Uh, if you have more questions, I think we'll be able to answer them in the uh, poster session. And as well, we'll showcase the site there. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. And then we uh, can move on to the last uh, presentation of this group, which is uh, by Hannah Hedeland, uh, entitled Towards Compre Comprehensive Definitions of Data Quality for Audiovisual Annotated Language Resource. So, Hannah, to you now. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I will go, as Alexander said, a bit more into detail regarding like the conceptual background and also regarding data quality. So um, this, uh, this set of questions was, of course, I mean, um, the whole paper is basically about data quality. So yeah, um, <laughs> and I think what we need to do when it comes to data quality is to recognize that um, now we have made it, uh, made it possible for researchers to actually share data. Infrastructure such as clearing make this possible. And um, the problem is now, as we also have seen that people do not reuse this data as much as we had hoped because the data simply is not always in a very good quality or it's not possible to tell whether the quality is in, uh, good enough for the purpose that you have in mind. So um, I think what we need to do and what we're doing within the Quest project, what I'm doing in specific, is to actually have a closer look at this data to see what it is. And it's very, very heterogeneous and we need to acknowledge this. And as, as um, if we are um, operating a, a research data centers and we are people working with technical questions, of course, we can think about all the nice things you can do with data if it's structured and if it's consistent, but it's not always the case that projects actually creating data need this. So we need to make sure that we don't try to apply quality criteria, which research does not need. And at the same time, we might want to, of course, um, make these options uh, more interesting to researchers. So uh, this is why, um, which is also now in the, in the slide, this uh, threefold um, differentiation between um, various levels of structuredness or of curation, where we try to focus on the fact that we have uh, resources where we don't know very much and the data is not structured. And we have um, researchers where we at least have an ID, like a collection of structure of the data. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we do have researchers where the idea is, for example, with the NL Corpora, that the data is structured and well described. And ideally, of course, we also have descriptions of the data which uh, link to, to common vocabularies, etc. So there is a very, very uh, broad spectrum and we need to take stock of the data and make sure we um, both to generic quality standards and to those very specific to certain use purposes. So I think that's the main point. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much all. You have been very punctual uh, with your three minutes. I know it is, it is very tight schedule. So this concludes the first, the presentation of the first group. 
If you have any questions that you would like to address to the authors, you can put them in the chat and then we can come back to those questions after the presentation of group two, for which I give the floor now to Bente. Yep, thank you. And uh, here is a presentation of group two. As you may remember, these were the resources that were written. So first we will have digitizing university libraries evolving from full text providers to clearing contact points on campuses. This is by Manfred Nölte and Martin Mehlberg. The next one is T for two. The archive of the Italian Latinity of the Middle Ages meets the clearing infrastructure by Federico Boschetti, Riccardo del Gratta, Monica Monachini, Marina Buzzoni, Paola Monella, and Roberta Rosselli del Turco. And the final one is towards an interdisciplinary annotation framework, combining NLP and expertise in humanities by Laska Laskova, Petya Ozenova, and Kirill Simov. Now, because we thought, Maria and I, that maybe we couldn't have the same question to seven papers because you would be tired of this. We have created another question for these three papers. It's not, I mean, both questions are relevant to both groups, of course, about users, usage and users. In which way have you taken requirements of the user community in consideration in the phases of designing and implementing your project? And then there are examples of discussion points. How many different user communities are you serving with your project? Do you see any problems in serving different user communities? How have you implemented the requirements of the users? Do you have any ideas how we can envisage a feedback loop so that researchers, repositories, infrastructures, libraries get feedback on whether their work is deployed by the community if it actually is meaningful for the users? What would you propose? I think we have seen in some of the papers that resources exist, but they are not really used. So we think this is an important question. We will move on to the uh, three papers, please. Uh, Manfred or Martin. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Manfred Nolte here, hello. I've activated my camera. Yes, there Perfect. I am. Okay, I will start. Now, um, this is the title of my talk. And uh, first, uh, what is my project? As a representative of a digitizing academic library, I'm a full text provider, a creator of data, if you like. I have transferred full text resources to Clarine in the past, and I'm suggesting an int intensified collaboration between full text providers and Clarine, and also to establish Car Clarine contact points on campuses. Uh, this also might be a good role uh, of an academic library to increase the awareness of use useful tools and resources of Clarine. I'm also addressing the issue of data quality, which have been discussed uh, here in the first group. OCR full text resources definitely have a certain error rate. The metadata could be rich and good, or few and of poor quality. Another question, how many different user communities are we serving? To concretely answer this, uh, German philology, linguists, digital humanists, and political science. In general, all those who want to use our digitized full text resources. Question, do you use any problems? Do you see any problems in serving uh, different user communities? No, libraries are used to, to this situation and we need to find and define a certain uh, transfer point which target group is supposed to be passed on to Clarine and what level of counseling are, are libraries able to fulfill? Last question, how to get feedback on whether the work is deployed? First, every imaginable, imaginable type of feedback would definitely be appreciated. Automatic late feedback is having a look uh, at publications uh, on the respective work. And we had such a positive feedback. In the past, I had direct contact, contact to the users, but on large scale, uh, that is definitely not possible. 
And with respect uh, to the question, if it actually is meaningful, uh, what about uh, collecting and forwarding the matching of requirements or the type of further requirements, which again might be uh, quality issues. And with respect to OCR full text resources, character error rate, word error rate, uh, that is the accuracy, file formats, abundance of metadata, the accordance with the original printed resource, like the uh, correct transcription of line breaks, the strictness uh, of character transcription and encoding. This finishes my presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And we just made it, that's very good. Uh, we move on to the next uh, paper, T for two. Uh, yeah, do you hear me? Think, yes, please. Alim is uh, the archive of the Italian Latinity of the Middle Ages. It's a long-term digital project started in the mid-90s, aiming to provide free online access to all the medieval Latin texts produced in Italy. It's constituted by both literary and documentary sources that are respectively about 400 works and 6,400 uh, documentary texts. Uh, they are encoded in XML TL and currently hosted by the University of Siena. Alim catalyzes the interest of many communities of scholars, philologists, linguists, historians of Latin and German languages, and historians of the Middle Ages. This is mainly due to the variety of the textual resources hosted in Alim, literary and documentary sources that are distributed along several centuries, from the 8th to the 15th century, in some cases relevant also for the lexical study of other languages, such as Lombard. Scholars belong the, belonging to distinct, uh, uh, although interrelated communities, according to their research questions, have different approaches uh, to the digital resources. For instance, uh, the philologists need to visualize keywords in context. Uh, the linguists need to calculate word frequencies. The historians uh, of the language need to observe word distributions in different diachronic segments, and historians need to identify and extract the named entities. Claire in IT decided to keep the original structure of the Alim archive in its repository of metadata by creating a browsable record for each document of the Alim archive in the VLO. Most of the original information contained in the TI header section of the Alim documents is preserved in the Clarin IT repository and exposed through the VLIO, the, the VLO. This uh, decision provides a philologist, a linguist, and historians with a user experience on the VLO consistent with the navigation on the original Alim environment in order to have a familiar environment. Clarin IT reflects also the Alim strategies on open access, open source. In Alim 2, the XML TI documents are open and Clarin IT supports Alim in planning the actions necessary to provide fair data. So uh, in conclusion, just a couple of words on the image of the slide. The uh, T for two of the title is an allusion to Alice in Wonderland, where Alice is Alim, the hatter is Clarin, and the Wonderland is Clarin as an infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And we move on to the uh, final paper here. Yes, please. Who will be speaking? Of course, thank you for the reminder. Uh, so I am going to present actually what is considered a work in uh, progress. Um, so the goal of our consortium, Clada Bege, is to build this Bulgaria-centric knowledge graph. And in order to do that, we will step on uh, already uh, resources that are already there, such as uh, the Bulgarian version of DBpedia, Wikidata, Bulgarian Wikipedia. And uh, we need to augment this uh, knowledge graph with facts. And uh, to do that, we take resources, or we are actually provided various types of resources um, by our um, partners from the consortium. And um, there 
quite uh, different type of uh, people with different background. We have historians, but uh, we have also linguists. Some of them specialize in contemporary Bulgarian, some of them uh, in medieval Bulgarian. So uh, we get different types of texts. And what we try to do is offer all of them uh, a unified annotation scheme, uh, semantic scheme, of course, which uh, in its turn is based on, uh, as you can see here at the bottom of the slide, uh, three resources, FrameNet, CDOC CRM, the ontology, and uh, we add to that also some uh, standard uh, named entity classification. Uh, we need that uh, to do some um, entity linking. All right, so this is the idea and where are we now uh, on our roadmap? Uh, we started uh, with our first uh, pilot project, a collaborative, collaborative project uh, between the Institute of Balkan Studies in green here and ourselves. Uh, we are, I represent the um, working group from the Institute of um, Information and Communication Technologies. So they gave us um, some research papers on uh, the um, Bulgarian minority that was based in Thessaloniki in the 18th, 19th century. And we tried to apply the annotation scheme we provided, uh, we made for them, and we got uh, quite an interesting feedback. Uh, and we saw a number of problems that um, are due to various reasons, such as uh, differences in backgrounds. Uh, historians have different notions, for example, for what an event is, and uh, the uh, concept of event is uh, defined differently in an ontology. So we have to work on that. And uh, what I can recommend is actually to have um, regular meetings and discuss everything. So yeah, it, it has been very inspiring. If you want to hear some more details, join us after. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are through our papers. There are some questions in the chat. Uh, I think we can have uh, at least uh, one. Can I, I take the one on the uh, libraries? Um, so uh, uh, which actions do you envisage to include more libraries at an international scale? And how do we take the collaboration between libraries to a higher level, not just issues relating to digital, digitized full text, but also a collaboration between the many library-based digital humanities labs? And I think uh, our, at least our library people should give us an answer. Yes, okay, uh, can you hear me again? Yes. Okay, uh, first type uh, uh, of the question, uh, uh, our activities to address uh, in uh, the international scale. A few weeks ago, I had a UFA, UFA meeting, Young Universities uh, for the Future of Europe here in Bremen, also virtual, of course. And, uh, and I would like to get in contact with uh, UFA uh, libraries and university libraries, and I would like to intensify my contact to Clarin. And the second part of the question, and how do we take the collaboration between libraries to a higher level, not just issues relating to digital form, but also a collaboration between the many library-based digital humanities labs. Uh, yes, we, we, also, we just also start setting up something like a digital humanities labs here at the University uh, of Bremen. And, um, I just, I, th I just think I should intensify my international connect con connections like Clarine and Ufim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. And I can see that Francisca de Jong has mentioned something, but I think she will share the link later, maybe in the, maybe a bit later. Um, but did you, why is it that you want uh, to get in, Manfred, uh, that you want to get in contact, more in contact with Clarin? I don't think you explained that. Um, I, I just want to intensify um, uh, the, the collaboration. And yes, I, I would like to, to know what, uh, what is the, 
the what are the the assets, the the tools. I would like to pass on. I would like to pass on scholars and scientists to Clarine. I, I would like to uh, give them first counseling, and and uh, to my opinion, the the interesting tools are at Clarine. Very interesting tools, uh, huge okay. amounts of resources, and the 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 scientists should go to Clarine. Perfect. Thank you. Maria, did you want to take one question? I think we can probably take one. So there is one question by Maché to the first group about quality, and I read it out loud. How much quality requirements can be defined in general in relation to the content of resources and not only metadata? Well, this is a very difficult question, and I don't think, think it has a, a single answer, but does anyone from group one uh, want to take that question? Well, if you want, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I please. I can uh, try to give uh, an answer because it's really, it's really difficult to, to set the requirements for, uh, uh, for the content because uh, if we talk about uh, audio, uh, as I said, uh, there are uh, a, a lot of different kind of, uh, well, in analog uh, recording, there are a lot of uh, uh, kind of career for, uh, for recordings and the quality is not uh, the best, okay? But uh, uh, then there is the problem of, uh, for example, feed the recordings and uh, with uh, devices that are not professional. So it's very difficult to set uh, a criteria for uh, requirements for the quality. We can only assure that uh, we have a good standard for the preservation access, et cetera. We can add some restoration for uh, in order to improve uh, the listenability of, uh, of the, the content, but it's very, in my opinion, it's very difficult to, uh, to set uh, criteria uh, for all the communities because uh, uh, this is the other big problem. So we can archive them, we can uh, make them accessible, but uh, uh, we can do something more. <laughs> okay, uh, this okay. is yeah. the... Okay. Maybe and I'm sure... Maybe I'm I sure can add a little bit there. Yeah. So yeah. I, I really think it uh, depends on how you define content. So for, for us, we also have audio recordings, but we do have a lot of transcription and annotation where you have schemes and conventions. And it's, it's quite straightforward to test against uh, conventions and annotation schemes. So there's yeah. something you, you can measure and uh, you can measure the quality of data when it comes to content like this. Yeah, and so, I'm sure it's totally different when, uh, as regards audio or written or other modalities. So, but yeah. let's stop now because I think yeah, we will not take we, more yeah, time than we are allowed to. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we would like to wrap this up, and uh, we want to thank all the participants who were here. We are 151, and uh, all of you who have been uh, providing papers and discussion.